Hallo. Hallo Instagram. Hallo Facebook-ish. I hope Facebook is on. Oh, it's on. Oh, it's on this time. How are you all? How is everybody? Emily's already here. Hi, Emily. How are you doing? And, oh, and Karen and the Luminous Path and Coach Dane and hello, hello, hello. Let's see, where are the other people's on Facebook? I never find the people's on Facebook anymore. I know you're there. How are you doing? It's a lovely freezing Sunday. You know, Instagram people, I have to um, excuse myself for looking so doggone orange. If you were to go off to Facebook, I don't look as orange. I, I feel like I need to apologize to a certain past president for looking so very orange because I'm not this orange, I promise you. So Diana is here and uh, Benifer is here. And, oh, hello from Ireland, how you doing? And Laurel and Lucy and everybody's here. It's so good to see you all. Well, I don't really see you all, but I see your little faces and your little icons. And I know I'm not alone. So welcome to the gathering room. As I said, it is a freezing cold Sunday here in Pennsylvania. And I have a story to go with that. As soon as people stop popping in like popcorn, I'm going to start my story because this, this is one of those stories that you remember to the end of your life. And as I was sitting thinking, what shall I talk about on the gathering room? All I could imagine talking about was what happened yesterday. Because what happened yesterday was big. <laughs> so it started out day before yesterday in the evening when my dogs started barking and barking and barking at something in the backyard. So we let them out and um, somebody poked their head out and said, I think he's barking. I think they're barking at a bird that can't fly. And we were like, no, they're fine. Let them back in the house. So they came back in the house. The next day, yesterday, um, Ro, Rowan Mangan, the gracious badger, was looking out the window and saw what looked like a round blue puff ball in the backyard. She didn't know what it was. She went out to see and it was a blue jay that had tucked his head under his wing and puffed up his feathers as big as they get to survive the night, which was no degrees. It was very, very cold. So here's this little puff ball. And at first she thought he'd been decapitated by a fox, but why would it have, it have left him there? We couldn't figure that out. So we decided he was probably alive. And Ro is very brave, having grown up in Australia where everything that lives it, it, besides the humans wants to kill you. Um, I, don't, I love animals, I love all animals, but there are a lot of venomous animals in Australia. Check it out. Anyway, somebody once wrote about, of our, Australia, our native language is screaming, just discussing the snakes and spiders that you get there. Anyway, so Ro is very brave and she went out and she took a towel and she flumped it over yonder puffball and she gently gathered the blue jay up and came in and put him in a box and we wrapped him in towels and left him in his box with some water and a little bit of oatmeal and then i started calling the animal rescue people the wildlife rescue people so i got in touch with the wildlife rescue people after about an hour and they said bring it in bring in the blue jay so i, I google mapped them they were about 40 minutes away so I get in my car and I and Karen puts the box with the Blue Jay in it, wrapped in a towel and all that, on the passenger seat. And I'm thinking, I hope he's not dead, but I don't want to look because for some reason I feel a little squeamish. And what if I opened it and then he came out and poked me? Because Blue Jays are notoriously scrappy. So I thought, OK, I'm just going to let him sleep through the drive. So I, I take off and almost immediately, from inside the box came the sounds of scrabbling. Scrabbling is not a good sound, you guys. It, it's not a good sound if you're making it. It's not a good sound if you're hearing it. Scrabbling alarms. It alarms everyone. So I hear, <laughs> but I'm like, all right, my heart rate spikes a little. I'm like, he can't get out of the box. It's a solid box. He's obviously not well. So he's not coming out of the box. I just need to get calm with the scrabbling. 
as some of you know, I've been working on calming my nervous system anyway. So I think this is a good opportunity to learn to lower my pulse rate and get into a state of peace, even though I am very alarmed driving along to a new place in the freezing cold with a box scrabbling crazily beside me. So I drove very, very carefully, very, very gently. I didn't brake too hard. I didn't accelerate too hard. I didn't turn too fast because whenever anything happened, the Blue Jay would go <laughs> and I would have to calm myself down again. So I was getting a bit of a flop sweat going and I, it was, I got onto the freeway. Now there's quite a lot of traffic for some reason on the freeway on a Saturday morning, um, but it's okay. Box is scrabbling beside me. We get into a kind of rhythm. I'm going 60 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour. Um, because and he gets lulled. The blue jay gets lulled. I thought he's he can feel like he's flying. I'll just lull. So I'm like singing a little song to the blue jay. It's okay, everything's okay. And he starts to scrabble. <laughs> I'm like, it's okay, it's okay. Ah, and I'm driving, and I'm and I, then I see something from the corner of my eye. And I look over to the passenger seat where the box is and the Blue Jay is standing on the box and I'm going 65 miles an hour in traffic on a freezing cold Saturday morning. Now, this is why I'm calling today's gathering room what to do when you don't know what to do. Because I really had not planned for this contingency. You'd think I would have. I've got a live animal in a box. But no, I assumed he couldn't get out of that box simply because I am not strong enough to get out of that box. Blue Jays are a different story. So there he's standing and I know them to be fractious and I'm going 65 and there's no place to pull over. And I'm thinking about contingencies in my mind. It's like if he starts going for the out of doors and flapping around the cabin, he could like hit me in the head and I could go all wild and cause a car crash and that would be worse that a blue jay getting a wing hurt. And I can't do that, so I don't. Uh, <laughs> and I think, what if he flies directly at me and pecks me in the eyes? So I think, okay. And I cautiously put down a pair of sunglasses on, off the top of my head. <sighs> we're driving, we're driving. The blue jay is looking at me, we're eyeing each other. Neither one of us knows what to do, right? So then I find a place, thank God, where there's a shoulder on the road and I can pull over. So I pull over, gently stop. The Blue Jay's like teetering on his box. I put the parking brake on. I put my little emergency flashes on and I go, all right, I have to assess. Now, sorry to toot my own kazoo here, but I've been practicing. I have been hysterically frightened almost my entire life. And I have spent the last half of my life or so practicing bringing it down, bringing it down to a place of calm, even though I have a very anxious brain. So when I'm actually in a situation that could go wonky, I kind of click in and I went clunk into a place of very deep relaxation, weirdly enough. It reminds me of the time I got my brain mapped and I sat with this brain mapping, these wires all over my head. I had a little shower cap on stuck with millions of different wires. And I was supposed to sit in front of a computer and there was a little um, cursor on it. And my job was to make the cursor go down. It had a sound with it too. And I was supposed to make it go. And I said to the people, how do I do it? And they said, we have no idea. All we know is that we've attached this, these electrodes to the part of your brain that gets active during an anxiety attack and you're trying to get yourself out of it by making the cursor go low and by making the sound go low. And they said, we have no idea how you do that, but if you sit there for 40 minutes, you'll figure it out. Don't move, they said. And off they toddled, those brain researchers, leaving me alone. And I sat there and I tried meditating and it did not make the line go down. It didn't make the sound go down. I felt better, felt a little sleep. Nope, anxiety levels still high. So I start thinking about things. My mind starts to wander and I'm thinking about coaching people, being a life coach, which is a thing I do. And I, I enjoy it and I'm very focused on the person I'm coaching. And as I think this, sure enough, the thing goes down a little bit. So I think, what if I imagine 
coaching like a group of 12 people, which I used to do in seminars. And it was much more high pressure, right? Sure enough, is when I imagine a larger group. Then I think, well, what about public speaking? Which terrifies me. What if I'm in front of a big group and I have to give a speech? And then I thought I'd been on the Oprah show once and it was live. And I said, okay, live on TV, potentially 20 million people watching me, at least 9 million, too much for me to even imagine. And sure enough, bulk, the thing leveled out, no anxiety whatsoever. Then I started thinking of more and more high pressure situations like skiing on a cliff in a blizzard without any visibility. And as long as I was in a very dangerous situation, the line was very low. I had no anxiety. So all of this to say, I'm in the cabin of my car, flashlights are on, parking brake is up, Blue Jay's staring at me, I'm staring at the Blue Jay, and I go whoop, into this place of deep calm. And then, and I do not know why, I will never know why, the Blue Jay walked off the box, he hopped onto my leg, and he settled in, like perched on my, in my lap. And I remembered what it was like when I would meditate in California in the woods and the, cover myself in bird seed and the little birds would land on me. And, it, and the sweetest feeling, that, they weren't as big as the Blue Jays. The ones that landed on me were little, but it's a very sweet feeling to have a relaxed bird in your lap. And I could feel the warmth of his little fluffy body. And so I got the, I gently picked him up and I said, you'll be okay. And I put him back in the towel and wrapped it around him. And I put him in the box and I put my purse on top of the damn box. And off we drove to the wildlife rescue people. They took him in and they came back and they said, man, he is scrappy. But blue jays are always scrappy. And I thought, he wasn't scrapping with me. <laughs> and I don't know why he did it. I, maybe he was just confused, but it was very odd behavior. And I have seen wild animals react oddly to people who were very, very calm for the last years, especially in South Africa at Londolozi when we go there. And so it shouldn't have surprised me, but I don't know if the bird was just dazed and wounded and saw me as a source of warmth. I have no idea. He just seemed really calm when I got calm. And I thought as I drove home from the wildlife rescue place, this is what I should tell the folks on the gathering room. Things keep happening to us that are like really genuinely scary. Like 60 miles an hour, no way to pull over, blue jay, wild blue jay uh, loose in the cabin. That's nothing compared to what most of us face on at least a weekly basis. All of you guys out there. I mean, we know of terrors that are, go way, way, way beyond even a car accident. And we're confronted by them day after day after day. And I thought it's kind of like driving along and hearing the scrabbling all the time. <laughs> like, oh, if that gets out of its box, oh Lord. And then sometimes it does get out of its box. And here's what I've realized. I looked back over my long, long life and I thought when bad things happened, and I've had a few bad things happen, not as many as a lot of people, I'm very blessed, but I have had a few. And every single time the thing that worked was to pull over and calm down in fact i was thinking that should be the i should put all over my house signs that say pull the f over and calm the f down only not just f and then i thought no that actually doesn't work because that place is so calm and that instruction is so quiet when it comes that there's not even any swearing in it. It's not emotional at all. It's gentle. It's like, pull over, calm down. So if you're having a situation right now, if there is a blue jay loose in the car cabin of your life, this is what you can do right now, like literally right this minute. Let's all calm down. Find a place to pull over. The gathering room can be your place to pull over. Everything else stops. Okay, you have the parking brake on as long as you're sitting in front of your computer or your phone hanging out with the folks in the gathering room. We're all here together. We're all gonna just pull over and calm down. So you don't have to do anything right now. So your heart's still pounding. You're still afraid of what's gonna happen. All right, next step is you go to the place beyond fear because that's where I was when I thought of 
skiing on a cliff or being on Oprah. I was in a place where I wasn't planning with, wait, I pointed at the wrong side of my head. I wasn't using the left side of my brain, the verbal, verbal calculating part to try to logic things out. Because when things are really colossally screwed up, they're not logicable. I mean, they're figure outable. Marie Forleo is right, they're figure outable, but they are not logicable. The way you figure them out is that when you get in the quiet, in the place beyond fear, there's an animal part of you that comes up and says, rather than die horribly right now, I am going to get still. And if you can get still in that way, other animals join you in the calm and situations turn out in ways you wouldn't expect, felicitous ways. I remember talking to um, my friend Stephen Mitchell, who's married to Byron Katie, who's a great spiritual teacher, and he was talking about some of her relatives, and he said, um, they don't have problematic lives because they're always questioning their thoughts, and I, like Katie does. And I thought, that's so interesting, that if you're questioning your thoughts and you're letting go of your worries, you actually go to a place where your life becomes much less problematic. And I saw it spelled out there in this car with the bird. Other people are just animals. The best way to calm down like a terrorist during a hostage negotiation is to speak in a low, calm voice yourself. I, I didn't, I've never done that. But Chris Voss, the FBI hostage negotiator, he told that, me that in a book he wrote, which you should read. It's called Never Split the Difference. It's excellent. Anyway, it's very simple. And I'm not gonna expound a lot upon it. If you can pull over by taking yourself to a space where you don't have to do anything for a few minutes and then get really still, what comes out of the stillness, the calm actions that come out of the stillness will figure out the situation and make it less problematic without your having to logic it, without your having to panic over it or think about it at all. Nature starts to work with you. Energy starts to work with you if you just pull over and calm down. Oh my goodness, so Tracy said, OMG, on Friday, a blue jay fed from my hand. Tracy, that was probably the same one. He was probably so overwhelmed by the experience that he came to my house and just sat in the yard for 24 hours. I'm, I'm not at all in any doubt that it was the same bird. So I'm glad we share an acquaintance Okay, and uh, this parenting adventure says, it's like co-regulating with our children. They catch our calm. Yes, I've been reading a lot of books on trauma lately, and the word regulating and the word co-regulating, those words come up all the time. If you have a dysregulated system because you've been through some trauma and you won't, you haven't found your way out of it, you haven't found a way to resolve it, you have to find a way to regulate. And one of the best ways to regulate yourself is to be with someone who is in regulation, which means that state of calm. It's a good word because it's not like typical calm. It's, a, it's like calm on steroids. It's calm when calm is absolutely necessary. You may have found yourself go into it if you ever had a serious injury or were in a situation where you had to get a child to safety or something. It's like, be, it's the place beyond fear, regulation. And um, if you are dysregulated and you need to get back into regulation, you need actually to be in situations that spike your fear because then you can teach your body to calm down. So it's this weird paradox. You have to be willing to learn to swim so you're not afraid of water anymore. You have to get in the water where you're afraid and you learn to swim. You learn to regulate your nervous system as you are slightly um, anxious as I was in the car with the blue jay. Okay, Alicia says, what am I supposed to do if I live with a person who disturbs me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the more reason you have to pull over. And by that I mean out of a place where this person's energy can strongly impact you. Now, I have had the experience, and I don't mind saying it, of feeling someone's energy impact me even when they were thousands of miles away. So getting out of the physical space of someone disturbing is, kind of an absolute and in fact you know you might want to really think about and while you've pulled over you might want to calm down and see what comes up as to a different way you might organize your life in the long term so you don't have to 
Either you're a master of non-disturbance or you can be not always with this person who disturbs you. Because um, sometimes you just have to get your own physical space. But once that happens, even, if you're highly sensitive, like so many people on the gathering room are, you guys, you know who you are, it's really important to pull over energetically too. And I do the co-regulating thing. I do it a lot with by going online or listening to an audiobook on like extra slow speed. Usually I listen to them on double or triple speed, but I go to extra slow speed when I want to regulate my nervous system down. So I'll listen to someone whose energy is already very calm and then I'll slow them down even more. And that brings my nervous system down into a space where my energy is invulnerable. So that's what I would do. Put in some earphones, put on someone who inspires you and whose presence is um, calming. Uh, Chris Voss, the hostage negotiator, actually says to his, I, I assume mainly male audience, he says, you're not going to believe who I'm going to tell you to imitate when you're negotiating with a hostage. And then he says, Oprah Winfrey. She's got the perfect calm, low, I know what I'm doing kind of voice that will co-regulate even crazy people into an aha moment. Yes, that is not a good Oprah imitation, but it helps, it helps me. So co-regulate with someone besides the disturbing person. Ellen says, I wonder why this happens when my son has a seizure, I get eerily calm, but then when it's all done and over, I freak out. This is your system co-regulating back into the normal space after it's been to the space beyond, place beyond fear, okay? So if it really is a traumatizing situation, like that bird, basically he got out of his box, he sat in my lap, we kissed, we made out a while, we went home, it was no big deal, right? Um, but if it had been a genuinely disturbing experience, after I was out of the experience, I would have let myself shake, physically shake, and freak out and make noises or cry or whatever. That shaking, freaking out thing is how the nervous system gets back into regulation after you've been in the place beyond fear, like high, high alert. So I suggest that if, you, if someone you love has a seizure, you take care of that, you'll be in the place beyond fear, then pull over away from all stimulation and, and anybody who could need you and calm down by freaking out, like let, yourself go, especially the physical shaking is really important. Um, they did a study of women who had cesarean births and they found that some of them forced themselves not to shake when it was over because they, you know, there were guests there, they were holding the baby or whatever, and some people just shook uncontrollably. Well, the people who shook uncontrollably had shorter hospital stays, healed faster, and didn't have lingering trauma. The shaking and the freaking out is really important. And it might happen weeks or even years after the event. That's what post-traumatic stress does. It hangs on and, and part of you is locked away in the place beyond fear. And when you're safe again, when you pull over and calm down, the energy comes out, the memories come up, it can be really horrible, um, but it'll be brief. If you get help for it, um, you'll find out that the freak out leave that you think is the worst thing you've ever felt and you're going to be depressed for another 10 years is gone in hours if you're in a safe space. And generally the nervous system waits for a safe place before it lets go. Just like I was eerily controlled until I pulled over the car. And then I could like get everything ready and, and deliberately calm myself. But before that, I was just like, gonk, numb. Okay, so Ann Wood says, what's the first turtle step toward calm for a person who's both anxious and in physical pain but wants to try? Okay, this is what you do. You lie down and, and relax completely. And then you go to the part of your body that's in pain and you don't try to stop the pain. You watch it as if you're watching, you're in the you look like stargazing in the in the sky or you're down you're scuba diving and you see a school of beautiful fish the pain is the fish and all you do is watch them and describe them you don't try to make them go away you don't try to bring them in closer you don't try to do anything you observe and i've been doing this with pain for the last oh well years really but the last several months when i started reading about it i found out it's powerful and I was actually grateful to have physical pain to work on because that's, I, I get physical pain really early, uh, easy. Um, 
easily. I have fibromyalgia and whatnot. And so I often have some pain to work on. And when you observe it, it's related to the fear and it calms the entire nervous system, which is on a toggle. It switches from hypersensitive um, sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight, freeze, to calm parasympathetic nervous system. And if you have pain to help you, literally help you, you can actually make the transition more completely. This pain is still not fun, but and neither is fear, but we can use these situations to pull over and calm down. Okay, Kirsten says, thank you for this. My unvaccinated 87-year-old mom is sick. And I've been so fearful. I think about Cloyd the snake a lot. Cloyd was a snake of my acquaintance. And I tell myself to calm the F down. <laughs> You're confirming all of what I was thinking this week. I actually was thinking, I mean, ultimately, our greatest fear and the curse that we share only with each other, not with other animals, is that we consciously know that we're going to die and that our loved ones are going to die someday. So in the end, that thought is always part of the anxiety spiral, at least in my mind. And that means that in order to really pull over and calm down permanently, like deeply, we have to be able to pull over and calm down even with the prospect of loss and death. And the interesting thing is the bigger the anxiety, the bigger the calm. Like I've been so grateful that I had this beautiful, sweet experience with this little wild bird. And the thought of the, the memory of him hunkered down on my thigh and how he stayed completely still as I picked him up. He didn't struggle in my hands or anything. Um, I'm so grateful. What a beautiful experience. And I hope um, I had that near-death experience where I saw a light and everything, so I, my fear of death went down dramatically. But what I hope is that all of us, as we contemplate that, will have to pull over and calm down to the point where our deepest fear gives way to that level of sweetness and calm. So I think maybe if we work hard at it, we anxious, hypersensitive people, can actually co-regulate ourselves to a space of not just of calm, but of bliss and of sweetness and of love. And maybe that brings other animals into other people and the creatures of the world, which definitely need us right now. Um, Buddhafield says, can you do this in the now for scary things in the future? Yeah, to an extent. You can practice them, and I do all the time. But when you're in them, it's a unique, you know, it, it's very real. You don't, it's not like when you were in practice. However, like I took karate for eight years and I learned to calm down while I was fighting someone, but it was always, of course, pretend fighting in the dojo. And only once did I get stalked by someone, by a man. I was in an arroyo in the desert and he started following me from bush to bush, you know, <laughs> and I like tried waving at him and he just hid behind the bush and then followed me. So I thought, yeah, I don't think he has good intentions. And I thought, oh, this is what I've trained for in the dojo. And it's different, but I had the patterning in my body to pull over and calm down. So in my mind, I pulled over and calmed down. I was in my dojo in my head. That was my place to pull over. And I turned around and I looked at the man and I smiled and I did this. And I thought, I'm gonna kick him in the knees. Because that's the thing, go for their knees first. Don't try to go for the face or the family jewels those are well protected and they can see you coming. Just a massive hard kick to, to the top of the knee and then you follow up. Anyway, he ran away. It worked out well. Where the blue jay came and sat on my lap, this man did not. He went away. Okay, Beatrix says, how can you get your anxiety down thinking of scary things like public speaking? I, for one, passed out cold the first time I had to give a public speech. And after that, lying there <laughs> with people looking down at me, I thought, I guess this is as bad as it gets. And I still have fear of public speaking, but I know if I faint, I'll be okay. So there you go. Again, it's about having an experience with it where you end it without freaking and running from the scene. You stay, they, it was in a high school debate me, and, and the judge said, uh, do you wanna just stop your speech? And I'm like, no, I'm gonna finish my speech. So I got up, I finished my speech, and now I know that's the worst that can happen, and I still have a massive fear of public speaking, and um, I just pull over and calm down. Calm down right there in front of the audience, and it seems to work. 
So Judy says, thank you, Martha. So reassuring. I found that in order for your pullover formula, I need to trust, not question how or why, but just trust that answers do come in the calm. That is what I felt when that little scene went down with the bird. I just, it took my breath away that there was something taking care of us both. You know, something that they, in the New Testament, it says God loves every sparrow that falls from the air. And this little bird was surrounded by as much love and comfort as I was. And it wasn't coming from me. It wasn't coming from him. It was coming from everywhere. And it held us both. And each time you can focus on that, you trust a little more and you fear a little less. And that's how it piles up. So we have two more questions quickly. Robin says, do you think that compassion is at the heart of this, surrender to the sensation rather than try to separate. Um, yeah, although it's not verbal. So even the sense of I am now not separate, I'm included is gone. There's just presence. There's no language at all. And that it's in that, in that no language that I first felt connection with horses, with dogs, and, and then with birds in the forest, and it still worked yesterday. Um, and I think that compassion itself is so much bigger than the sort of sappy feelings we feel with our hearts when we're focused on things like pity and, and you know, the forlornness. And uh, when we're not thinking about anything except presence, then the compassion that happens around us, to us, through us, doesn't even have an emotional quality. It's just this sweet peace that doesn't need to be translated into human terms. Okay, and finally, Dr. Donna says, can you share where you are reading about watching the pain book? Yes, that is a book called The Way Out. I did a whole gathering room on it a little while ago. It's by Alan Gordon. And I've read several more books on similar um, pain cures since, but his is still my favorite. So Alan Gordon, The Way Out. It really is the way out. Pull over, calm down. Watch how the world regulates with you and you begin to regulate better yourself. And then we will all come back next week and co-regulate together in the gathering room. I love you guys. Thank you so much for showing up. I will see you again soon. Bye.